brilliant. I think I, I saw some uh, early questions coming through uh, a moment ago, Amy, if we can um, jump back. Oh, there we go, perfect. Um, so there's one uh, there, second one down, how much of the guides come from our own recruitment policies? So um, I think, uh, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but my uh, uh, understanding um, and from the, the drafts and things that I've been looking at, there's very little that is um, coming from sort of lifted directly from our own uh, internal use. Um, like you were saying there, we've been talking to innumerable different uh, people within the sector, getting as much different perspective um, as possible. I think the exception is around onboarding, um, where mm -hmm. we're, we're quite proud of the uh, the onboarding process that we have uh, internally our, our tnl team um is is growing quite quickly at the moment um, i think we've had uh, i'm trying to think off the top of my head at least 10 10 new colleagues start over the last couple of months um and so delivering that onboarding process um has been really important uh, and in fact you know it's, it's added challenges for us as we're a, a remote team we don't all work in the same place um but yeah having put a lot of time and effort and, and had really good feedback from those new colleagues on the onboarding process that we've taken we're, we're bringing uh, some some relevant ex extracts of that uh, into the ultimate guide um, but beyond that I, th I think i'm right in saying chris that it's um otherwise it's pretty crowdsourced from from all sorts of different uh, inputs across the sector is that right yep no that's correct um uh, both in terms of the onboarding which is the area that we very much went in-house on because as mm -hmm. you say we're very proud of that process um and it's been quite an innovative one too um, and very glad to kind of share as well some of the templates that we've developed and been using uh, for those. But yeah, in terms of the kind of wider recruitment, because again, we're not a setting and also in terms of the kind of organization we are being remote first, it just wouldn't be particularly applicable um, to um, what's required for a nursery setting. So yes, we've been going to essentially subject matter experts across the sector, um, both in terms of positive lessons learned and negative too, as in the things yeah. that are working and the things that aren't. That's it. Brilliant. And there's a, a nice, yeah, tricky question under that one. Um, fantastic question, a very sensible question, uh, asking how do you get a diverse team if you only ever get female practitioners applying? Um, and I guess, you know, we could, you could expand that question, um, you know, into all sorts of different uh, examples of diversity that if you just don't have the candidates, then that's very difficult. Um, I suppose, yeah, from my own uh, personal reflection, um, and again, this is, is something that we take really seriously uh, within our own organization when we're recruiting people is one thing to try and get that diversity and recognizing that means we need diversity in our candidates so that we then have diversity in our uh, colleagues um, the really key thing is trying to be open-minded about um, how and where uh, jobs are promoted um, where they're they're publicized and people are made aware of them um, you know there's there's the thing that i often challenge myself about is that uh, my kind of default place that I would go to uh, advertise a job is naturally the place that I would go to look for a job. Um, and that then tends to end up with, um, you know, people who look or sound or come from a similar background to me are more likely to apply for jobs in the same place. And then we end up with a team that, uh, you know, is not as diverse as we would like. Um, I think we're, we're doing our team a little bit of injustice, Chris, by the fact that it's you and I who are both about the you know sort of the, the most similar in in look and uh, manner and and you know where those kinds of uh, criteria and diversity that actually uh, belies a much more diverse team that we we work with every day um i don't know if you've got any other thoughts um on this one in terms of uh, how to find that diversity if if you don't have the diversity in candidates mm -hmm. no no I, I actually think it's a terrific question as well a, a real challenge question which are really really important um, and it is a difficult thing. And actually, it also ties into a conversation that we were having with somebody in the production of this pack where in terms of diversity too, quite often people will make the argument, oh, well, if you are a setting in this environment or in this environment, then you're more likely to be diverse or less likely to be diverse. Therefore, it's fine if, say, if you're in a, I don't know, a rural setting in the middle of maybe Devon or somewhere like that, and you find that it can look quite monocultural, um, to put it bluntly within your nursery environment, a lot of people say, well, that's that's just how our village is or something. But actually, even then you're doing um, children a disservice because you're not still necessarily finding the best person for the job. And maybe there are ways that you can look a bit further afield or find new processes to recruit and make sure that you are getting those applicants. And also, again, in terms of making sure that, you know, diversity is such an important thing for children as they develop, for them to interact with people from all kinds of backgrounds and walks of life and so forth. So, 
Yeah, it's a really good question. And the how, obviously, it is vitally important and something we're trying to address in this pack. But essentially, it comes down to making sure you have those processes that can enable people who maybe otherwise are being filtered out to be part of the conversation, to be to even feel that they can apply or to even see the job advert and so forth, um, yeah. as well as having those processes that don't just have a bias towards one kind of person or another. Yeah, I think the, the, the last thing I'd add on this as well is um, there's a there's a huge amount of value where you know the sector is so skewed in terms of uh, in favour of women in uh, particularly in practitioner roles that actually if you're an organisation who makes a point of uh, explicitly stating your aims to you know aim for uh, better gender balance within your team so London Early is foundation is the, the one that immediately comes to mind mm -hmm. because they are you know the, the largest organization that I know of that makes a real point of talking about men in their workforce and wanting to recruit more men for their settings and just by talking about it more by putting stuff on their website about it by you know uh, sharing things on social media that that's a particular uh, cause that that their organization their leadership are really focused on immediately you know that's that's where my head goes when i think you know early years organizations that employ men um so i think there is a, a huge amount of value again in that um you know uh, as we'll be we'll be covering through the masterclass and through the pack those uh, quite simple seeming steps um that mm -hmm. we can take and we can implement to just be that point of difference um you know ultimately we're competing with lots of other recruiters um to to fill our vacancies and i think um Often it, it doesn't take a lot uh, to win that competition in, in areas like that, um, mm -hmm. which is certain things that we'll be we'll be covering in other weeks. Um, Absolutely perfect. We've got a few more uh, practical questions here around uh, the masterclass, uh, so I'll rattle through the answers to these. And uh, Chris, I'll let you ready yourself. I'll, I'll come to you with another question in a minute once I've gone through these. So um, uh, let's go uh, yeah from the bottom up. So uh, are the videos every Monday? So yes, uh, all of the masterclass sessions will be. Uh, at the same time uh, each week um, over the next six weeks. Uh, so we're holding them at 6.30 uh, every Monday over the next few weeks. Um, we've tried to, to pick a time that doesn't eat into people's evenings too much, but also uh, hopefully gives most people flexibility that they'll have, uh, they'll have finished work for the day and be able to join us. Um, that said, uh, the uh, question there at the bottom of if uh, we miss a live webinar, um, all the recordings, uh, every masterclass participant um, has for lifetime access to all the recordings you can come back uh, watch them again as many times as you want um, it's a great question around uh, submitting questions um, it's in fact not something that uh, you know full transparency that we've uh, talked about as a team um, but I can say now that yes absolutely um, people uh, in general regardless of the masterclass are always very welcome to submit questions and thoughts uh, to the team the best way to contact us is uh, team at thatnurserylife.com um, and absolutely, uh, people who are uh, watching any of our masterclass sessions um, uh, on catch up, so to speak, uh, are very welcome to submit any questions uh, afterwards that, that occur to them. Um, depending on how many we get, we'll either um, you know, answer them individually or it might be that we put a, a little section in um, to one of the masterclasses later in the process to bring all of those questions um, to the fore, because um, that's a, a really good point that we want everyone to be able to um, get involved. Uh, absolutely. Um, and then we've got the last uh, practical question there around uh, when will the ultimate guide chapters be released uh, so that is every friday uh, so already uh, everyone who's uh, already joining the masterclass everyone who's already signed up uh, is able to access uh, the introduction to the ultimate guide uh, via that nurserylife.com uh, you'll need to be uh, logged in you'll need to be uh, signed up with your uh, free tnl membership account uh, logged in with the email address that you uh, used when you uh, bought your spot in on the masterclass uh, if if you're not already a tnl member um, and then you can head to the uh, premium resources uh, area of tnl uh, and you'll find the introduction ready and waiting for you in your library there uh, and then every friday lunchtime we'll then be releasing uh, the chapter ahead of the next monday um, and it'll be automatically uh, updated in your library so you'll be able to access it straight away um, one thing that i missed as well uh, a moment ago on the question around um, submitting questions outside of our masterclass. We are also going to be running every Wednesday our uh, live social media events, um, which will be, again, picking up on the, the theme of the week, um, sort of building on what we've talked about and what we've worked through in the masterclass, 
uh, again, guest hosted each week on social media, um, running a, a live Q&A. Um, so absolutely, there'll be plenty of opportunity to ask those questions um, through those social media events, uh, as well as sending them through by email. Uh, brilliant. Chris, I'm going to fling another kind of behind the scenes how the sausage is made question over to you, if that's all right. And I think uh, it'd be really interesting to, to hear your kind of, uh, you know, editor-in-chief uh, perspective on um, how you decide what should and shouldn't be included uh, in a resource like this, this ultimate guide to Elliot's recruitment. Mm -hmm. So, wow, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> quite tricky to answer too. So essentially, and actually, it's not that different to how we judge what goes on platform. We try to be led by conversations that we develop with people in the sector, um, feedback that we get as well from our readers and our users in terms of what their needs are, and what their perspective is and so forth. Um, so that's kind of one of the elements essentially is just developing conversations. Because again, I don't come from an early years background originally, um, although I've done my best over the last year to try and cram as much as I can. Nonetheless, I'm never gonna have the insights of a sector professional, particularly one of many years. So yes, we've tried to develop as many conversations as we can about what are areas of critical need. Um, there are conversations that I've had, for example, that were counterintuitive sometimes, or I was quite surprised um, by what I heard in terms of challenges for the sector. One of the things that surprised me most was that the biggest threat, if you have a level three member of staff that you might lose, is not another setting, but somebody outside the setting or outside the sector. So that was quite interesting. And essentially what we do is we kind of, we get together as an editorial team and sometimes a wider team. We'll weigh up the feedback that we've got. We'll also look in terms of what in-house competency and experts we have. We'll look at people that we can work with as well outside of the organization and what insights they can bring. And then it's somewhat of a balancing act between kind of express need and what we can deliver. Um, so, but what we've tried to do with this pack is as far as possible, be as comprehensive as we can possibly be in terms of picking up all these different strands. The chapters and the structure of it and so forth all emerge from sector conversations um, and areas of need. So we're hoping that we, what we put together does reflect what people are looking for um, and provides, if not all of the answers, at least some insights and some different ways of working that might be helpful. Fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Amy, if we can double check on any uh, last questions that we've got on the board as we come up towards the, the end of this first Mastercard session. Uh, so, yeah, a couple of interesting questions there. Uh, let's go for uh, the bottom one first. So how do you select people uh, when you only get one or two people applying at once? Um, I suppose reflecting again, like this is a situation I certainly um, had in my time. Um, particularly when I was running my uh, family's group of nurseries in Somerset, um, recruiting for a rural setting is, um, I think, especially difficult. You know, naturally, the, the pool of candidates is that much smaller. Um, there's a there's one answer I can give, which I suppose is the, the technically correct answer, which is, you know, it's really important to remember that not hiring anyone is also always a valid choice in a recruitment process. Um, it's not a case of we've advertised a vacancy, we have to give the job to someone, and it's just picking the best or alternative, the, the least worst um, organization, not organization, the least worst candidate, um, there is always the option to not hire anyone. I say that's the technically right answer because I, I absolutely recognize that isn't always very easy to do um, at a practical level uh, in this sector. Uh, we talked, you know, as we, we started the session, we talked uh, quite a bit about, you know, the relevance of, of ratio and having enough people to, to operate as an earlier setting. Um, and so it, it, I absolutely get that it, it kind of can feel very difficult to not um, not choose anyone if you've got some candidates and you need someone in, in a role. Um, I suppose the, the thing that I'd come back to is that that first question we posed, you know, how much does a bad hire cost that actually not choosing uh, anyone is potentially less costly than choosing the wrong person, um, even if it means you need to wait a little bit longer to get some more candidates in. Um, if you've only got you know, one or two candidates, and they're both really good candidates, then I think, you know, it's it's no different picking between, uh, you know, a couple of people, um, as it would be picking between five or six, um, provided you, you're kind of keeping that, that straight edge of, I can always choose no one. Um, and you're then, you know, you're measuring people against the role that you've set out to recruit, that as part of that design and that preparation process, you know, what the role is, and you know exactly who you're looking for. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the the key thing for me there. 
Uh, Chris, I don't know if there's anything that you'd add to that. Certainly not very much. Um, <laughs> of course, there is always the challenge, as you say, that sometimes it feels like you don't have much of a choice. And even if, as you say, there is always the technically correct choice of not offering it to anybody, that matter of ratios and so forth comes into play. So again, I'd say a couple of things that we try to do, at least with this pack, is first of all, help with those parts of the process that can at the very least increase your chances that that isn't the case, that you should have hopefully more people coming in by tweaking certain things. Of course, again, in a more rural setting, it doesn't matter how good the process is, you're not going to have as many applicants as perhaps one in a major city. Um, I guess another thing too that I'll pull it back to is the element of training. So for example, when you're coming to ratios again, one good thing and one thing that we try to mention in this pack is thinking about your existing um, human resource, to put it in a really you know cold way, yeah. nonetheless, um, what can you be doing with the people on your team who perhaps if they haven't got that level three training and so forth, that early years educator qualification, you're going to be reducing the risk you're not going to meet ratio if you're helping even more junior people in your organization work towards developing qualifications and bettering mm -hmm. themselves. So it just reduces the chances, doesn't eliminate, but reduces the chances that you're going to have to make a decision about hiring a person because you may only have those one or two applicants in play who you're not convinced is right for the organization, but you don't really feel like you have a choice in that moment. So I'd say there's no quick fix for this. Um, even this pack, as good as it is, doesn't guarantee that it's going to solve every problem in recruitment but nonetheless it's just thinking about all those areas right even before you put even thought about who you're going to hire and kind of putting things in place so that yeah. you just de-risk every stage of the process no that's yeah really good point as well thanks chris um fine i'm, I'm purposefully saving the uh the the if we had to choose one question for last I think that's going to be a good one for us to finish off on uh so briefly then uh is the guide applicable to settings with smaller budgets Simple answer is yes, absolutely. Um, we, uh, with everything that we do at TNL, um, ninety percent of what we produce uh, is free. Everything that uh, is on TNL to benefit individual professionals in the sector uh, will always be free. Um, where we charge for for premium content like this that that supports whole organisations, we always uh, come at it from a, a perspective of charging um, the the best value, um, the the lowest price that is um it's feasible for us to do that um so our our you know our aim is to really um overwhelm you uh with the ultimate guide that for um a a relatively small investment we're going to be uh, equipping you with dozens of tools and templates uh, things that you can take away and use straight away things that you might otherwise have to pay someone to help with um even things like the the advice and the, the top tips uh, in the masterclass itself um, around uh, you know, writing really good job adverts. Um, we're going to be yeah, unlocking all sorts of content uh, through the Ultimate Guide and through our Masterclass program um, for very little uh, investment so that you then don't have to spend any more of your budget um, after having joining us for this um, to go out and recruit the best possible uh, people for your team. Um, where we're recommending stuff in the guide uh, for people to go and use, absolutely, we always have a, a weather eye on the budget and we absolutely re recognise that uh, no matter what size of organisation, there's never uh, a huge amount of surplus budget in this sector. Um, the question is only sort of um, the proportionally that a large organisation's you know small surplus might be bigger than a small organisation's surplus. Um, so we're yeah 100. Um, the guide is is absolutely applicable to to organisations with smaller budgets. Um, and on the last question, then Chris, you've had uh, plenty of time to to see that one there lurking. Hit me with. Um, you know, if we put, really put you under pressure, which uh, of the, the one week of the masterclass would you say is the, the standout, the most important to attend? Um, I mean, obviously, firstly, I'm going to say definitely attend all of them. Uh, <laughs> they are all very good and all important. And it's quite tricky, actually, to answer that one. I, If I was talking about myself and the areas of the guide that I have found either most surprising or most important, uh, I would say either, and it may not be the one that jumps out, but the very first drop that we're doing the first week of after this one of around things like designing roles and planning process, I'd say that's actually really important. Um, I'd say in terms of the overall size of the guide as well and the information we're putting out, it makes up a much larger area of the guide than you would expect. Um, and the other one that I'd say is around inclusive hiring and the law, simply because that's, again, something which 
is a huge elephant in the room in the sector in making sure that our settings are serving best interests of children um, in terms of the uh, composition and the diversity of the setting, both in terms of gender and everything else. So that's probably the other one that I would jump on board with. Um, well, I jump on board with all of them, but I think those will probably be the ones that I think really yeah. do serve up some pretty, pretty great stuff. So it's just it. I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I think likewise, I think, you know, actually yeah. every one of the weeks um, is going to add a huge amount of value and be really good fun to take part in and hopefully be really useful. Um, and the fact that, you know, all masterclass participants can uh, get hold of the recordings of these sessions um, forever and as many times as you need um, does mean that, you know, if you if you need to miss a week, that's no, by no means the, the end of the world. I think for me, the the standout week, the best one to to really make a an effort to join us for live uh, will be that uh, week five when we look at um, those questions of inclusive hiring. As we've got Greg Bottrell uh, joining us as our guest. I think that will be a, a really a really great session to be part of live to be able to put questions to Greg um, to to take part in that that discussion and um, and that Q and A. Um, so I think that that week five is the one that I would say is the, the highest value to uh, attend um, live, and then all the others. Um, if you can't attend them live, make sure you catch them up um on the recordings afterwards perfect well with that we have come to the end of week one um thank you very much chris for uh, joining us and giving you such uh, good insight into everything that's uh, in store um thank you as well for uh, all the rest of the team that have been uh, instrumental in in putting both the ultimate guide together but also uh, tonight's first masterclass uh, event uh, and especially amy who as well as being our moderator tonight has been um ably performing the role of producer um, and will be uh, throughout the, the next few weeks um, so big thank you to her um, and yeah all that's left for me today is uh, have a great week i hope you uh, yeah have a, a fulfilling and exciting week at work uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next monday same time 6 30 for our week two of the masterclass um, and cracking on men uh, there's also the uh, qr code on the screen there and um, that if you want to uh, share uh, information about the masterclass if you've uh, enjoyed this evening and you know other people uh, in the sector that might want to join in um, please use the the qr code there to uh, share information um, and we'll yeah we'll see you next week bye bye